hour of empowerment. Uh, as you may remember, we have been discussing in the past three weeks about good governance. We gave you the definition of good governance and the benefits uh, we may enjoy when we have good governance. And also we talked about measurements and indicators that enable us to see whether there is good governance or, or not. And also we talked about the prices or the consequences of lack of good governance and also uh, we talked about your roles in establishing good governance. I have a good news today. Today, we're going to have a very exciting discussion with two great experts. And they're going to help us understand more about good governance. First, let me introduce Dr. David Phillips. He has a PhD from Bradford University. He is an author and development economist who was a senior staff member of the World Bank Group for 14 years. He is the author of two books and a number of papers, most recently on migration and the diaspora. His recent book is entitled Development Without Aid, The Decline of Development Aid and the Rise of the Diaspora. We have also Dr. <coughs> Aklog Birara, who joined us uh, via Google Hangouts. Uh, he earned his PhD from John Hopkins University's Advanced International Studies. He is the founder of Center of Inclusive Development in Africa. He has written books such as Roots for Democratization in Ethiopia, Why Unity of Purpose Matters, Waves, Endemic Poverty that Globalization Won't Tackle, But Ethiopians Can, and The Great Land Giveaway in Ethiopia. Thank you very much for both of you for coming here and sharing your insights and idea with our uh, viewers. Uh, first, let's, let's talk about democracy versus <coughs> good governance. Can we say that a democracy is mature and stable without good governance? Well, uh, good governance is, is critical to stable democracy. So it would be difficult to say that it was stable without good governance. and. Uh, Democracy, uh, you know, is not a, simply a matter of holding elections, as I think we very well know by now. Um, for example, in Iraq, uh, they've held elections, but it doesn't mean to say it's a democratic society, because a democratic society requires the development of institutions. Uh, institutions are developed uh, from the ground level uh, all the way up to uh, the national parliament and uh, and the separate uh, and the. The Constitution, which, as you know, in the United States consists of three branches, uh, the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. But underneath those branches, there's an enormous number of layers of institutions. And uh, these include, for example, um, business membership organizations, citizens associations. And there needs to be a fairly dense structure of these kinds of institutions to act, if you like, to insulate the people from arbitrary rulers. So a true democracy is one which has a, 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 a very, shall we say, a dense uh, institutional structure. And that, of course, is, can only be developed over time. And um, this is something which, uh, which is much more important and much more relevant than simply holding elections. That's great. That's great. Uh, Dr. Aklog, you want to say something about the relation between democracy and good governance? Yes, a couple of thoughts, please. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, you and Isat for organizing such a very important uh, uh, discussion uh, on a very relevant uh, topic. Um, I think, um, um, you know, when we talk about uh, the relationship between good governance and democracy, uh, we need to, uh, from my vantage point, uh, uh, to make a distinction between the kinds of democratic institutions and good governance in developing countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, and um, in uh, highly advanced uh, countries where which have taken hundreds of years uh, to develop democratic institutions. Um, because there are oftentimes um, in Africa and certainly in Ethiopia, um, you know, th th this uh, very loose uh, kind of, you know, discussion, you know, we, we need uh, democracy, we need democratic institutions and, 
uh, and so on. Fair enough. Um, but I think um, the uh, uh, way I would uh, uh, position uh, the discussion is that uh, good governance is really ultimately about accountability of government to people. It's people anchored. Development has to be uh, people anchored. Political institutions must respond to people. Elections must be uh, free and fair. Uh, economic institutions must be robust and open uh, opportunities for everybody. Um, there should be really uh, institutions that are very, very strong and separated uh, definitely from political parties uh, and perform um, the functions that make uh, societies uh, prosper, uh, that reduce uh, corruption, that reduce instability, um, uh, and that uh, uh, hopefully create what's called uh, sustainable and equitable development. Um, these you know, conditions certainly do not exist um, in uh, uh, many African countries, but at the same time there are good indicators in Africa that some countries are on the path uh, to uh, good governance because they have embraced overall some modicum of uh, uh, democracy. Uh, I just like to pose a question when we talk about uh, the, the correlation between uh, good governance and democracy. Uh, there is certainly now uh, a, a cycle, uh, a counter cycle uh, that questions uh, what democratic institutions mean, uh, really. So we, I do hope uh, Dr. Phillips and I would have an opportunity to sort of go over that because the cynicism uh, out there, uh, certainly when I was in the Middle East recently, I heard it. Um, what do you mean by democracy? What do you mean by democratic institutions? Look at Egypt and the reversal in Egypt. Look at Ukraine, the corruption in, in, in Ukraine. Look at Bangladesh and the corruption there, uh, and so on. So I, I, I think we need to have a discussion because we, we just want to make sure that um, uh, we are on the same page. Uh, you are, uh, yeah, by the way, both of you said that uh, good governance is a true test of true and sustainable uh, democracy. Uh, and we're going to talk about Scandinavian countries because uh, Egypt and other countries may not be a good uh, examples to show how democracy and good governance uh, reinforce one another. Uh, but we're going to talk about uh, the model, the model in the Scandinavian countries. But uh, yes, uh, we need to talk about uh, some of these discussions about the democratic institutions we should uh, uh, show uh, how they, they can reinforce uh, and, uh, and uh, help uh, a country enjoy good uh, governance. Uh, the next question is about uh, the signs, the indicators that enable us to, to determine whether there is uh, good governance or not. So what are the most important indicators and signs we should look for? Well, uh, as I was saying before, the, the key to, to uh, good governance and the key for that matter to democracy is the development of institutions. And uh, probably uh, the, one, of the, one of the most important indicators of, of, of strong institutional development is trust. There has to be um, a degree of trust in society. For example, trust either uh, either trust based upon some um, community uh, understanding or trust through institutions. Uh, one of the ways in which trust can be developed through institutions is through the judiciary. You have a judicial system, a court system, which, for example, can um, arbitrate contracts. The ability to arbitrate contracts is critical to the, to the institutional development because people have to be able to either trust each other based upon, say, family and clan relationships, or if, if the society is more sophisticated than that, they have to be able to trust each other through some sort of in intermediary institution, which would be the judiciary, the court system, the, the system of laws and regulations. And, the, and there has to be a level of, of, of trust in the rule of law. So, for example, to go back to where I was before, you can have a society in which you have parties and you have, you have a general election, 
but that is very superficial. Underneath that, there's an enormous, an enormous infrastructure of institutions, and around the based on around those institutions, the community over time, over generations, develops a sense of trust in each other. Even if one clan or one group doesn't like the other clan or the other group, there must be some ability to to arbitrate uh, problems between them. I do a lot of work, for example, in Somaliland. Somaliland is a country which, as you probably know, has, has a, a clan structure. And Somalia, even more so, they have a clan structure. The history of that clan structure is one of distrust. Now, in order to establish a, 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 a mature society, a, a stable society, a stable democracy, there has to be a way of intermediating that distrust, there has to be a way of settling conflicts, preferably through the courts, because the traditional system is really clan-based. So it has to be through a state institutions of some sort. And as that, as that apparatus begins to be accepted by the people, over time, the, the traditional rivalry will subside and stability will, will develop. And that, so it's over time you get stable institutions and stable democracy. That doesn't mean to say that people won't go to war with each other because people have been going to war with each other throughout human history. But at least it means there won't be from year to year instability and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, warfare. By the way, is it possible to use, uh, for example, some democratic institutions uh, to you know, create some kind of stability and trust between clans, uh, because in some countries, I once, I was in Botswana, and I saw that uh, they use traditional organizational structure to create that kind of trust, stability, but also they use democratic institutions to reinforce uh, what the government, the government wants to uh, apply. So when we talk about uh, using institutions to create stability and trust, we're talking about both traditional and uh, other formal kinds of democratic institutions? Exactly, but the, the, for example, getting back to Somalia again, yeah. the general sort of view is that the clan-based um, relationships are, will not bring the economy forward. You know, the, the, the economy has got to move beyond the traditional clan-based relationships. It's got, to, it's got to move beyond family law it's got to move, move beyond clan law. It's got to move towards a kind of national system which, and, a, and a centralized government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that essentially the clan law and the clan traditions and the tradition of rule through the elders can only get you so far. At some point or other, you've got to move beyond that. Mm -hmm. And that's when the state institutions come into play. And that's when it becomes very important to establish trust through state institutions. You're right, you're right. Uh, Dr. Aklog, you want to say uh, something about the measurements and also indicators that enable us to, to uh, determine whether uh, there is uh, good governance or not? Sure. Um, uh, I think uh, the literature uh, is uh, replete uh, with measurements uh, of what constitutes good, good governance. As you know, uh, the Mo Ibrahim uh, Governance Index for Africa does an annual survey. Um, Freedom House does the same thing. There are numerous institutions uh, who do, who gauge uh, the extent to which go good governance um, has taken uh, uh, roots or is being institutionalized. Um, um, I, I agree uh, with uh, Professor Phillips um, that um, uh, obviously, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, institutions matter a great deal. Uh, but what do we mean by institutions? Um, uh, institutions uh, really uh, uh, are um, ones that are crafted um, and that reflect shared values of the society, that empower the, the society, that enable it to come out of poverty, that enables it to express its views, and so on. Uh, for example, uh, freedom of movement. Um, uh, obviously, um, uh, um, stated and institutionalized is such a thing. 
um, uh, freedom of private property, uh, freedom uh, to live in any part uh, of a given country, um, um, whether it's feder federal or, or, or uh, unitary. There are um, actually, you know, uh, uh, when we have a conversation about Ethiopia, there are basic things, you know, uh, in terms of what constitutes good governance. Uh, for, uh, you know, Ethiopia is one of the poorest countries, one of the most independent countries in the world is one of the hungriest countries uh, in the world. Um, there is really um, uh, a, a great deal of social indicators, whether people have enough to eat, whether people have employment opportunities, whether they have safety net, and whether these are really um, uh, you know, sustainable and uh, assured by the state um, and, and by society. Uh, so the freedom... Uh, 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 to live without hunger uh, is an indicator in my, in my judgment. The freedom to move from one part of the country to another is an indicator. The freedom to organize political parties and to compete is another indicator. Free press is an, another indicator. The um, um, uh, possibility of whether the judiciary system is impartial uh, is another indicator. If the court of law uh, doesn't adjudicate uh, conflicts in such a manner as to depoliticize it, you know, uh, then you, you don't have a really uh, uh, good governance. And time and time again, the measurement is by um, uh, the Mo Ibrahim Human uh, Governance Index, by the United Nations Human Development Index, by Freedom House and the others, Reporters Without Borders, and so on. All of them. Re repeatedly indicate that uh, what is defined as good governance doesn't really exist, even compared, even compared um, uh, with sub-Saharan African countries. For example, I heard you say about Botswana. Uh, perhaps we can come back, you know, later on about what makes good, you know, what are the, the, the success stories in the world, not only in Africa but in the rest of the world that really have enabled millions, hundreds of millions of people to uh, come out of poverty. What are they? Um, that will probably give us uh, also a good indicator of what governa good governance is. But when you have um, political elites of any kind, whether ethnic or religious or whatsoever, and they merge the following things, namely ethnic elites, government, and state, where, you know, this merger of the three, namely elites who rule the country, government which runs the country, the state, the body politic, where they are merged, it is troublesome. There is really, we can't say that there is good governance, even if there is growth. So I will stop there. Yeah, oh, it's, a, it's a very interesting discussion. Yes, uh, as you mentioned, with those uh, indicators, if we measure uh, Ethiopia and see whether there is good governance or not, uh, obviously the, the, the existence of poverty, uh, lack of accountability and transparency uh, shows that uh, uh, Ethiopia is rated uh, uh, very poorly when it comes to good uh, governance. Let's talk about good governance and poverty. What are the most important uh, roles uh, good governance plays in the fight against poverty. Uh, may I start, uh, um, uh, please? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. You know what? You know, um, when I was at the World Bank, I, I, I don't remember running into Dr. Phillips, but the bank uh, is a very huge institution, um, uh, and and people come in and uh, and and go. So I didn't have the the, the fortune of uh, meeting you. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, there was quite a bit of uh, analysis done on, uh, on Ethiopia, um, as there always is, uh, about any country where there is a heavy um, interest and where there is a heavy flow of funds. One of the most uh, in-depth analysis uh, done, um, you know, a few years ago was uh, 
um, about uh, um, the relationship uh, between poverty uh, and the rural society. Um, you know, well-being uh, in Ethiopia. The, uh, the agricultural agency was really um, the title of the of the of the of the research. What it shows basically is that um, you know, if I take a couple of examples, um, in in the rural areas where the vast majority of Ethiopians live, and uh, on which the country's economy relies, um, rural peasants are not empowered. They lack the necessary tools, voice, for example. Um, they lack um, inputs because inputs are um, differentiated by loyalty and are located on the basis of loyalty. So, um, and, and land allocation is also differentiated on the basis of uh, loyalty to the party. Uh, women, uh, I mean, it's staggering statistics. Um, um, you know, uh, in a country where uh, slightly more than 50% of the population are women, the participation of women in Ethiopia is one of the lowest in the world. Um, as a consequence, uh, you know, when we look at uh, poverty, uh, we need to look at both urban poverty and rural poverty and see the extent to which um, over the past 23 years the rural economy of Ethiopia has basically extricated itself from the traditional ways of uh, uh, production um, uh, 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 and whether the country has been able to uh, achieve food self-sufficiency. So one of the core issues for Ethiopia um, uh, in terms of an indicator of good governance versus poverty well, is whether the, the Ethiopia has achieved good self-sufficiency. The other I like to uh, propose, Ethiopia has one of the highest youth populations in the world. It's fairly similar to North Africa and uh, uh, parallels really the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. The youth population is huge, you know. And then you look at the question of how many jobs um, are created per year. At minimum, Ethiopia needs two million jobs for use per year, per year, you know. So when you look at the social indicator in terms of opportunities for jobs, creating jobs, the Ethiopian economy has literally failed. You know, we need to just take a, two examples here, recent examples. The 150 thousand Ethiopians who were forced to leave Saudi Arabia represent the tip of the iceberg because millions of Ethiopians now are forced to leave their country to work in South Sudan, in North Sudan, in the Middle East, in the rest of the globe. So, um, uh, you know, this tragedy in Saudi Arabia is a mirror image of a system that has literally, literally failed youth. Recently, just in the last two weeks, the Kuwaiti government is in the process of legislating uh, to uh, uh, push out 80,000 Ethiopian migrant workers from Kuwait. The question in my mind, and I think for our discussion, is why do Ethiopians um, uh, leave their country in large numbers each month? The answer is really the economy, the national economy, is unable to accommodate the hopes and aspirations of Ethiopian youth, especially females. So um, uh, I think poverty and good governance are directly linked because on the opposite side, countries like Ghana are trying you know, to focus on youth. Um, other countries in East Asia, if we talk about the East Asia miracle, you know, I know East Asia fairly well. I, and I have worked in that part of the globe. Uh, you know, you look at East Asia, the East Asian miracle. What miracle are we talking about? If we ask the miracle in East Asia, um, uh, whether it's Malaysia, whether it is Hong Kong, whether it's Taiwan, whether it's Korea, whether it's Singapore, uh, whether it's emerging uh, Vietnam, you know, structural reforms take place at a very rapid rate, meaning Rural folks are able to be absorbed in the urban areas because industries are flourishing. 
This was the case in Ethiopia. There's no linkage whatsoever between the rural sector and the urban sector. Therefore, it has effect in terms of poverty. Poverty lingers, you know, to the extent that the structural, uh, the, the necessary structural changes, the necessary policies haven't taken place, haven't taken place in the country. Arsabas, thank you. Uh, thank you. We, uh, we're going to come up and discuss uh, with, uh, with you about the East Asian countries' case uh, uh, in the latter uh, discussion. But uh, right now, uh, Dr. David, do you think that a country can have sustainable development uh, without <coughs> good governance? Are there any <coughs> cases? There's, a, there's a, a new book out called, I think the title is Why Nations Fail by Asimoglu. Um, and another uh, writer. And uh, one of the uh, important uh, 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 points made in that book, or that they try to make in that book, is to draw a distinction between what they call inclusive institutions and extractive institutions. And they argue that um, traditional government, traditional economies are characterized by extractive institutions. These are institutions whereby one, say, elite group extracts a surplus or extracts resources from the rest of the population. And there are many examples of that kind of economy. For example, an economy based on mining. Let's say, uh, absolute, let, let's say the extreme example was apartheid South Africa, for example. There was an economy where a small minority of the population extracted resources from the rest of the population through, for example, the mining industry, through diamond mining, gold mining, and, and so on. Um, and, but there are also many other societies that they would argue, for example, were extractive types of societies. And they then argue that those kinds of societies or economies cannot lead to sustainable development. So they argue that sustainable development requires what they call inclusive institutions. So an extractive economy is one which they argue is doomed to stagnation in the end and cannot con continue to develop in the long term. And I, I think there's a reasonable truth in that, in that proposition. The fact of the matter is that good institutions which allow uh, a broad representation of the people are also institutions which allow what you might call a rational allocation of resources, like a rational allocation of investment. Uh, societies which have these uh, extractive institutions do not have a rational allocation of investment. Investment is concentrated according to the demands of the elite and not according to the demands of society as a whole. And the kinds of, uh, the kinds of laws that, that you need in order to allow um, an economy to develop uh, include, for example, a liberalized business entry, business entry and exit. People need to be allowed to start up businesses and to exit businesses. Then labor needs to be allowed to migrate. Markets need to be reasonably open. I'm not suggesting here some kind of neocon agenda. I'm just saying that in relation to some of the restrictive regimes that exist, you need to have a much more open markets. And the World Bank, as my, uh, my colleague is saying, is of course um, one of the leading uh, advocates of open markets. But open markets, we can, we can accept that the, 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 there's a limit to how far you can open markets, but nevertheless, you do need these inclusive institutions, and these inclusive, inclusive institutions are associated with open markets. And so, the answer to your question is yes, certainly up to a point, good governance and good institutions would be associated with a more rapid rate of economic growth. Of course, they don't, they're not the, de the determining principle, because economic development is also determined by many other yeah, things. Exactly, yeah. And in fact, good institutions might just as well be dependent upon economic development as on the other way around. But, you know, I suspect there definitely is a correlation between good institutions and good economic development. In fact, some of the uh, aid and growth research done by the World Bank um, has, has, has found ex out that exactly Countries with good institutions are countries which also have higher rates of economic growth and which also, by the way, can use development aid more effectively. 
But we can talk about development aid a bit later. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. have uh, an agenda on that yeah. one. Uh, my next question is, uh, Dr. Aklok, about uh, corruption. Corruption is uh, one of the signs of lack of uh, good governance. The question is, how much African countries, including Ethiopia, are losing because of corruption? Uh, thank you uh, for that question. Um, corruption is probably as uh, uh, the World Bank's president, uh, former president Wilson said, uh, a cancer um, that uh, really uh, uh, bleeds um, uh, Africa. Um, and countries uh, like Ethiopia. The research, um, uh, by the way, corruption has been going on for a long time. I remember uh, the big issue as the World Bank, um, you, uh, uh, you know, when I joined in the 1980s, early 80s, uh, was uh, corruption in Indonesia, in the Philippines, and the like. Um, however, that disease, uh, has spread like a virus um, uh, uh, to Africa and um, the amount of money stolen um, from the continent and sifted out of, siphoned out of uh, the continent to the rest of the world is staggering. It's roughly $419 billion between 2002 and 2011 um, in a continent where 48 percent of the population lives uh, roughly on less than a dollar twenty-five a day. In 2011 alone, um, uh, the amount of money stolen from the continent, uh, uh, I'm talking about sub-Saharan Africa, is uh, 52 billion dollars. Um, Ethiopia, there were several studies done uh, on Ethiopia and corruption and illicit outflow. Uh, I'll cite three of them. Uh, one of them uh, was a study by UNDP um, uh, uh, between uh, 2000 and 2008, 2009, where UNDP indicated that $8.345 billion uh, was stolen out of Ethiopia and, 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 and sifted out. Um, but um, soon after, uh, Global International, uh, Financial International, uh, International did a study and um, indicated that the amount um, from 2000 to 2009 was 11.7 billion or 12 billion dollars. Um, for a country that's a dependent and relatively poor, that's a huge amount. Uh, the University of Massachusetts did a similar study and came up with roughly the same uh, amount. Our estimate, based on data that is available in Ethiopia and outside, is that Ethiopia loses about 3.26 uh, or so billion dollars a year. That's roughly the, the same net amount of aid that the country receives. So it is huge. It is unbelievably huge. So no matter how much money the country receives, no matter how much it exports, no matter how much money is re re remitted, and by the way, um, I like to discuss, you know, remittances uh, with Dr. Phillips because I have read, read some of his articles and I have several, you know, issues with 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 the, with the thesis. Um, uh, but um, you know, we'll come back to that, I believe. Uh, the amount of money that's being sifted or siphoned off Ethiopia is enormous, and it's crippling. In fact, in the words of uh, um, um, uh, the uh, global financial uh, uh, integrity, uh, Ethiopia is being bled by uh, the money that's being illicitly um, taken out of the country. And no matter how poor people work, no matter how hard they work, no matter how ordinary people who are, who are living on salary or who have small you know, shops and so on, no matter how hard they work, this amount of money that's being taken out of the country is, 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 is unbelievable. It, it, it really requires uh, some significant intervention from the donor community, for example, from the diplomatic community, from uh, foundations, uh, from academic institutions. Otherwise, this bleeding is going to continue. 
and it is going to keep the country poor. Because if you look, look, if you look, when we come to Ed, I'll give you some statistics that, that are relatively recent. But if we look at per capita income um, and the ma amount of aid, uh, inflation, and, and so on, uh, Ethiopia is really sort of an outlier in, in, in every case. Um, uh, aid increased from 6 or 5 million per year in 1997 to 4 billion today. You, you, we need to ask the question, okay, if all this money, which is roughly estimated to be about 30 billion official development aid, and then if you add the non-official development aid, it might be 35 to 40 billion dollars, you ask the question, is the glitz of growth that we see in Ethiopia in terms of buildings, in terms of villas, in terms of roads, in terms of some, uh, uh, you know, infrastructure, is that really a good indicator? What happened to the money? My argument um, uh, uh, in my book, Waves, is basically a lot of money to the, to the, to the tune of perhaps 30 to 40 percent of foreign aid is stored, you know, uh, stolen in the country. And so the compound effect is huge, the effect of poverty is huge, the effect on migration of talent is huge. By the way, uh, Dr. Aklog, uh, corruption is uh, relatively new because uh, as recently as three decades ago, corruption was not high as uh, we experience today. Today, from top to bottom at Kabale, even world at level, corruption is high. So do you see that trend? Because uh, in the past 20 something years, corruption increased, increased a lot. And it looks like because corruption cannot be, uh, cannot uh, progress and flourish without people, society embracing it. So it looks like the government in Ethiopia has been doing a lot to make uh, corruption normal. Dr. Asagid, it's a very important question and uh, it will be refreshing to hear from uh, Dr. Phillips as well. But let me just give you uh, um, uh, some statistics. Uh, if you take uh, the imperial era um, and look at foreign aid, and most of the aid came from the United States, there is very little or no indication of corruption at all. Under the DERB, the military junta, of course, uh, development aid was literally nil. Uh, most of the aid came from the Soviet Union. Uh, the total aid amount I calculated when I was at the World Bank is 3.4 billion over a period of 17 years. You can't, we can't find, you know, many of us, uh, uh, many Ethiopian economists, both within the country, outside the country, have tried to search the extent to which there was corruption under the military leadership. Whatever we may say about the military leadership, there was very little corruption. Now, the question is, what uh, induced uh, such an immense amount of corruption in Ethiopia in the last 23 years? There are factors. One factor clearly is when the current government took political power, the kinds of institutions, uh, independent institutions, free press, independent judiciary, the rule of law, despite the constitution, were not really established. Civil society was literally decimated. There are no independent journalists in Ethiopia that we know of. Civil society organizations have been literally uh, criminalized. So you have really an open field for corruption. The other is if you have, you know, as is the case in Ethiopia, if corruption takes place at the top and, you know, um, uh, the top is not made accountable, you know, um, through the judiciary system, then the institutional culture is to go ahead and in the government services steal or ask for bribes. Two studies were done by the World Bank in less than two years. One study was done by Kilimanjaro International, a Tanzanian firm. The other one uh, recently by, by somebody else. I haven't seen the final report. Both of them show that corruption in Ethiopia is institutionalized. 
as you said, Dr. Asagir, it starts from the top, it goes down to the village level. Practically no one in government service that I know of, even supporters of the TPLF and EPRDF tell us that you cannot do anything without bribing someone. It is really more than that. You know, if, what, if it was petty bribery under the imperial system, you know, uh, somebody who wants uh, uh, something done, you know, would take a boat or a, a ship or whatever it is, you know, uh, perhaps, uh, um, you know, symbolically it was important even then. But, you know, today, you know, when you have um, uh, prices being fixed, export uh, uh, prices being fixed, when you can tamper with data in terms of what, how much you are importing, how much you are exporting, how much you are paying, where you are putting the money, when the banking system itself is politicized, then you have really a national crisis. You know, the entire system, the corruption permeates Ethiopian society. The entire society, land allocation, licenses, procurement, trade transactions, importers, exporters, construction, procurement, all of those. In Ethiopia today, they can't take place without bribes. So, it, it is a national uh, uh, tragedy, and it actually averts, you know, the sustainable development, the equitable development of the country. Actually, Ethiopia is not really performing the, the way it should perform. If you look at uh, um, the statistics, again, I believe in the statistics, um, the circle of prosperity. You look at all African countries, take all of them, look at them. The countries that have per capita income of 5,000 to 15,000 uh, dollars, eight sub-Saharan Africans feature in that category, including Seychelles, Botswana, Mauritius, South Africa, Namibia. 1,000 to 4,000 dollars per capita income per year that are on the ascendancy, Cape Verde, you know, Swaziland, Ghana, and the like. Then you look at kind, countries that I call breakout nations, 1,400 to 1,000. You have Zambia, you have uh, Sao Tome, you have uh, 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 Senegal, and countries like that. You then have countries that are less than 1,000. You have a group of 13. Ethiopia is outside that. You ask the question, how come Ethiopia, which is identified as one of the more fastest growing countries in the, in the uh, 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 not only in, the, in, in Africa, but in the world, how come per capita income is less than 390 today? Where does, where, where is the miracle of growth? Um, so we, we really have a problem and uh, corruption is pervasive. It envelops the entire society. Nobody can do transactions without bribing someone. And many people who do not have confidence, I go back to what Dr. Phillips said. Dr. Phillips said, trust. You know, trust in government is a fundamental indicator of good governance. In 2010, Gallup Paul did, conducted a survey and found that the Ethiopian government is one of the least trusted in Africa. Institutions are among the least trusted. It is, uh, officials are among the least trusted. Elections are among the least trusted. So when you don't trust the government, what happens? There is a consequence. People take out their money. So they are voting with their money by taking out their money too because they don't have confidence in the, in, in the future of the country.